All right. Hello, everyone. So I have a presentation with a lot of nice, colorful pictures, so it should be <laughs> entertaining. So my name is uh, Jakub Krčmář. I'm a co-founder at Veracity Protocol. And uh, I came here with a simple topic, um, which is the key challenges of tokenizing the physical world, because the way I see it, the adoption of decentralized system and blockchain, uh, physical world there is a key for that as well, and it has challenges. So f the physical world is rather annoying compared to digital one to, to work with. I guess I don't need to describe it here at all. And, and the, the tokenization, what it can bring, there's so many things. We can imagine my favorite example is, for example, this artwork from Pablo Picasso, which probably nobody here has enough money to buy, but which successful tokenization can bring a new democratized way of people can invest even a few dollars in painting like that, and which is just one of thousand examples. So the main question is how we connect physical objects or assets of items of any kind with digital ledgers. So it's even more annoying that there's this f thing in supply chains which right now are rather very complex, not really connected, and there's no end-to-end -end, end -end traceability and, and surveillance. Problem with that, we have a lot of sensors, but uh, there's a lot of room for uh, ma data manipulation, for unverified and inaccurate data, and of course for, for counterfeits in the, in the process. And uh, of course blockchain itself is not the solution. For example, with artworks, we see a lot of blockchain-based solutions which are saying uh, the provenance on blockchain will solve the problem, or it could be with pharmaceutics, or it could be in any other sector. But in the, the supply chain, just with, uh, sorry, just with provenance on blockchain and with no link to the physical item itself. Of course, the item can be replaced at any time. The data can be entered uh, wrongly by a wrong party, wrong data. Uh, there's a lot of room for manipulation. Uh, Tags and chips are markers, are also not perfect and final solution. There's a lot of items and examples you, where you can't attach it to it, you can't work with it. For example, again, f n nobody will let you to put anything on an expensive artworks. And again, there's problem with them. What if they are removed or duplicated or, or tempered with, or uh, there's false data again in a play, and the normal user doesn't have any way how to recognize it was tempered with, uh, or uh, what to do with, with it when it's missing. And the main problem is that you are connecting the entry into digital ledger with the tag or marker itself, but not, not to the physical item itself. So, and this is, of course, a problem not only in art, but also in manufacturing industry, where you have uh, supply chain manufacturers ordering parts from China, 3D printed, uh, without any way of checking the provenance, luxury goods, people buying fakes with no ways how to check if it's original and then getting being fined, like in France. In pharmaceuticals, where there are actually people dying because of fraudulent drugs and security papers and on and on and on. So, uh, of course, we have artificial intelligence here to help. Uh, so, hello to that. And so, it's just not the buzzword and not something as simple, just like image-based search, which is already working and it's, it's nice, but we are here solving a bigger problem. And it's basically how to, for example, identify and secure uh, and then verify, for example, two identical things. So again, in artwork, you can't really, if it's a f perfect forgery, you can't tell which one is original, not even if you look up close, because with current technologies, uh, it can go so far, you, you have no way of telling, and it could be the same way for packaging or uh, for a box of of pills or in any other market and example. And so basically what we do with our one proof technology is that we use uh, basically fingerprinting of the microstructure of the physical item itself 
to do the verification and authentication. We're basically using the, the physical item itself and its, its surface as a sufficient data source for, uh, for authentication and for linking it with a digital entry. So for example, with artwork, you, you, you take a f fingerprints, the close-ups, and uh, then it's easily saved to uh, stamped and, and this is the missing link between the physical item and, and the digital ledger. Uh, this, of course, this process works with any material with a unique, unique structure where unique details can be captured. And so, for example, to give you an example of how far it is, it works with digital prints from high density printer. Uh, so we can, we can identify each one. And, and it works with any material with a unique structure. It can be leather, metal, wood, paper, uh, textile. It can be also uh, the way how luxury goods manufacturers are making labels is unique because they are using um, some material in a unique way, in a unique machines. And this can be all teach the, uh, we can teach this the algo using machine learning, for example. And it's that far that just using a smartphone we can even tell the difference between individual sheets of white paper. So just to basically show you how uh, cutting edge the tech is. And, and uh, this is, when you have something like this, it's then very simple to use this fingerprint, the material structure, in many industries for many things, uh, in, in, in many supply chains to solve a whole lot of problems, and then, of course, to add this missing link uh, between blockchain, for example, or centralized database, or any other digital ledger, and uh, the physical item itself. And uh, since it's lightning talk, it should be fast, right? So that's basically a taste of what we do. Uh, to give you more info, we have other technologies we work with. We have uh, 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 visual-based, computer vision-based uh, uh, condition reported and automated QA. We're also using audio and machine learning for early detection of malfunctions. Uh, uh, and uh, many technologies which basically, in our view, we used to be able to not only link the physical items to digital ledgers, but also track them in through the supply chains in their entire life cycle, all the way from raw materials to the manufacturer, to the buyer, to secondary, secondary market. And um, yeah, that's it. And I would love to hear your questions. Thanks. Uh, doesn't the surface of the materials change over time? Uh, yeah, so there's many variables in the play. The surface can change. Uh, uh, if, uh, if use cases to use uh, mobile phones, you have a lot of cam different types of cameras, different types of lenses, for example, and it's something where we deploy machine learning. So you can use the same material with different lenses. Uh, it can be stretched, it can be changed, but it's still, you can still teach it so it works. For example, we do, uh, we do this demonstration. We basically take white sheets of paper, we stamp them. You know, you cannot stay, tell by naked eye which one is, which one, it all looks the same. But uh, there's a difference which we can tell. And if, even if you draw over it, it still works because the way how we are teaching the algo is basically to overcome this problem. So for example, with artworks, uh, there's crack over time in painting or it can get stretched, but that's again something you can teach the algo. And when we are using also data set based machine learning, uh, we, where you don't even have to use fingerprinted, you just teach the algo what makes the original original based on the material, uh, unique material properties, uh, then it's even, even, even easier. <laughs> How do you find the fing fingerprint? I mean, do you mark it up? Uh, that's a good question. So what we use, uh, we use augmented reality. So basically, uh, uh, we do like two layer approach. First one is you take the overview picture of the item and, and then uh, the algorithm selects places where to take fingerprints. 
we, and then augmented reality on the phone, for example, guides you uh, where to take it for protection or for later verification. Of course, in industrial setup on like production line, for example, the, it's, it's much easier. <coughs> that uh, connectivity between the supply chain and the, if you have the markup at the very beginning of the factory, it goes around the globe. It goes to the box, box to pallet, pallet to container, container to ship, ship to container. Many places where people can swap the box. You will only check the, your, your fingerprint at the end of the supply chain, mm -hmm. which is too late. So it's like the weeks too late before it was stolen. So how, this connectivity is interesting, but not really fast enough to catch the problem. So what's, it? uh, uh, it's incorrect. So what's important to know here is that any physical item can be protected and tracked. So it doesn't have to be the item itself. It can be the box, it can be the pallet, it can be the packaging, it can be the seal or, or anything. So then it depends on the use case and on how much in the supply chain you apply the tech to, to track not only the physical item at the end, but also all the packaging it's involved with, or the containers itself, for example. No, what I mean, if someone will swap it, swap it with the fakes. Mm -hmm. So you, what happens in supply chain is that you have the container, you have the one pallet with the iPhones or pairs or whatever, and someone will swap that particle pallet. It will continue to travel, and you will not discover you have the one pallet of the fakes uh -huh. until somewhere and somewhere at the end in the shop, or maybe a little bit earlier, will scan and find that fingerprint. So that's, that's where, uh, that was my point. Yeah, so for example, for that particular use case, of course, normally in supply chains they have cameras scanning the QR code so they can identify the pallets, right? But the QR code can be replaced, can be duplicated, you can mess up the process in many ways. So we see there's a lot of opportunity to change the pallet. But uh, if there's already cameras in, in set and we, if we apply the, uh, our algo to it, our tech, you can al also do the security of the external security elements. You can secure uh, the position of the label with the QR code on the structure of the of the material itself, which gives you enough information, and it's impossible to to replicate the same way. For for that's for example, and there's many other ways how to how you can do it with uh, uh, another technologies as well, including including chips embedded inside, which you can uh, you know uh, connect to remotely, and uh, it's all risk management then, but. We can deal in the whole supply chain, no matter. For example, one use case we solve is in, in, uh, in Industry 4.0, where it's fully automated factory. And there's this process from the incoming raw parts in the containers, in a cargo, all the way to finished products. And there's so many risks in the between that something else came, or a bomb came, you know, <laughs> or something's missing, something is in wrong state, is damaged, and so on and so on. So you can apply this tech. Uh, to it and then use all this information to store it with the digital passport with the identity of that item on the blockchain for later uh, provenance check and for verification. So for example, in supply chains, the, the parties in the supply chains doesn't have to trust each other. They don't have to trust the central authority. They just trust the mechanism, which is the, the beauty of it. If, uh, it answered your question. <laughs> So you said there are many ways to verify the quality, well, that the product is what it is. So we can scan the surface itself, we can scan the labels, the position of labels, etc. But uh, do you have an algorithm how you will do that? So what is the protocol in this case, what you will scan, what you will rely on while analyzing that uh, object at the end? So can you repeat? I didn't, I didn't. So, <laughs> you said Sorry. there are many ways using your protocol, using your technology to ensure that the correct object. Okay. Yeah, that's right. We can scan the surface itself. We can scan key points, foot, fingerprints. We can scan the package. We can scan the label. We can scan uh -huh. position of the label and verify it. So, but what the way will you choose? What actu how it actually will be done? Do you already have that protocol, that uh, flow? Uh, no, the order technology I was talking about is already developed, is working, uh, uh, can be right now used in any part of the supply chain. What we are developing right now is 
to integrate all this technology on top of blockchain-based infrastructure where you can save all this information and where businesses can come and use uh, their own blockchain solution or specific blockchain solution and connect it in a modular way with this tech. So uh, that's... Uh, it depends to, on the use case. So it's it, we're extremely flexible and uh, in what to use where because it can vary a lot based on the use case. Somewhere you can solve a big issue with just storing one simple information in one part of the process. Somewhere you need to do a, a whole lot of information in the in a, a most of the supply chain process. So it really depends. It's not simple to answer. I guess it's too many questions, but I'll be around. So thank you very much. <laughs>
Um, we've done a lot of different programs in the past years at HRF to try to... There we go. To try to uh, get information into the country in various ways. We started uh, with a little bit more flashy sort of ways, doing hot air balloon launches, um, you know, working with specifically with North Korean defector organizations to, uh, to find out what would be the most effective, what information they needed. Um, in response to our flashy hot air balloon launches, we got death threats from the North Korean government. Actually, this is kind of funny because we, I, we, our office uh, is in the Empire State Building in New York and we got a fax to our office and our whole staff was like, what is that noise? What is that? We didn't realize we had a fax, but this is what we're dealing with. There was a fax come in that's, that was a bomb threat to our office from the North Korean government saying, if you continue your work, we're going to blow up your office. Well, we are in the Empire State Building. So if he wants to blow up our office, it's a whole other can of worms that's going to start. But this just goes to show you the level. You have to start wondering why would a leader of a country be so afraid of his people having a magazine, of his people seeing a movie? What is it? It's about control. It's about control. And we really want to empower the people in North Korea to be able to make their own decisions, at least have the knowledge of the outside world to make their own decisions. Um, we've hosted several other events. We did a hackathon where we in, North, in San Francisco where we brought, you know, a hundred different uh, tech uh, creative advisors to come and try to figure out, like, how can we connect this country? How can we work around a system that is so, uh, so set up to isolate, to isolate and control the people? And it's really funny because with all of the brilliant brains, everybody trying to create mesh networks and discuss all of these new technologies, we ended up coming up with something that was just very analog uh, that came from all of the North Korean defectors that we work with. After hearing so many different stories, we kind of started to see a through line in these stories. And everyone we talked to um, would tell us a part of their story that always involved coming to contact with some sort of outside media information. Like, I saw this movie that made me uh, think that, oh, maybe, you know, I sh my, like the world I've been told isn't real, or I read Animal Farm and it started to make me think that, oh, I'm like living in this uh, on a daily basis. But so uh, three years ago, these buttons are not working. There we go. <laughs> three years ago, we launched a program called. I see, I told you I'm not technical at all. I start. Um, hmm, now it's off. Okay, <laughs> three years ago, we launched a program called Flash Drives for Freedom, designed in a way just to meet people where they're at. Uh, most people in North Korea do not have access to a computer, but they have access to a uh, Chinese uh, media viewing device called a Notel. It's basically like a uh, portable DVD player, but it's got a USB and a micro SD port so they can play media in that way. Um, so we just started kind of in a grassroots uh, movement saying, hey, Everybody in the Western world has a, a seven or eight flash drives in their drawer laying around that they're not using. Why don't you send them to us? We will professionally wipe them. We send them to our partners in South Korea who are all North Korean defectors. We let them curate the content because we've, we've done this in the past where people are saying, oh, you're sending Western propaganda into North Korea and they don't want to see it. We're like, okay, we are not going to curate the content. We will let the North Korean people decide what they want to see. We're just going to try to flood the market and make outside information and media as readily available to the population as possible. Um, um, so this is a little bit old, but since we started, we've uh, collected almost 200,000 flash drives. Um, and is this the video? I don't know what's happening. I'm sorry. Um, that's not my slide. I can tap dance while we wait for this. Um, <laughs> well, since we well, since we launched, we've collected almost 200,000 flash drives. Oh. oh, well, now the sound is playing on the video, but not the. <laughs> what he said. Oh, here we go. Okay. So I just wanted to play a little video about what we've been covering in the last couple of years because it's really become this grassroots movement that was able to engage, 
engage people in the conversation about the convergence of technology and human rights. I'll let you say this first. I felt like that could kind of express a little bit better than I could uh, verbally. But, well, you know, what I really appreciate about this program and what we've done is that, you know, it <laughs> is that, you know, it starts with a problem and we found a very basic solution, but it gets a, it's a way to engage people that might not be actively seeking to get into this conversation about technology and information as a tool. You know, the same as, I guess we all kind of felt that when, you know, the World Wide Web was created, that it was just going to connect everybody and that information was going to bring us all together. But the first thing that dictators start to do as they consolidate power is isolate and start to control access to information. And what we're trying to do through this project in a very sort of analog hack sort of way is just to, to, you know, to disseminate, to break down these walls and to get people the information that they're desperate for. You know, we have people come up to us and say, well, aren't you worried about the consequences of people coming and, and finding and like being fought, found with these drives? Yes. You know, we worry about that every day, but we're not like dropping these flash drives in somebody's backyard and they find out like, oh, what's this? No, they're actively seeking to go buy it at the black market. They know the risk they're running and they're willing to take that risk because they're so desperate to connect with the outside world. And I feel like it's our duty. We know what's happening and if we don't, if we don't do something, then they're just going to be in the dark forever. They're going to exist like that satellite. So, like that satellite image that we saw before. But we have the power to change it and start with a very small, very small plastic piece of material that you might be throw that you might throw in the garbage. You might not even know is in your desk. But if you send it to us, we can repurpose it, give it new life. It's a recycling story and you can, you know, break down some barriers. So that's what we're here to do. And I'm really appreciative of your time and you guys coming and uh, listening to me run my mouth for a couple hours, for a couple minutes. <laughs> Uh, thanks. It's really awesome. So I would have so many questions. Okay. Uh, we can talk after a while. I got answers. Let's go. <laughs> um, maybe just two for now. Um, is it possible that you actually launched the USBs with the balloons like that from China? Or is that uh, an issue for China? Second mm. question. How is the data selected by the North Korean defectors looking like? What, what are they okay. actually sending there? Oh, yes, and I should have covered that earlier. But um, we've, you know, the, actually the balloons, when we've done that before, were launched from the South Korean side across the DMZ. And honestly, the balloons are more for publicity, more for PR. I mean, some of them are effective, and they've been doing that for years. Um, but... Uh, it, it's unreliable. You never know. We've actually put trackers in there to see where they go, and some of them end up in, you know, the river. So we're at, more and more we're working within the natural uh, trading economy that's happening along the Chinese border. So we're not doing the balloons in China. Certainly not. It's just not as 
visually stimulating to just show somebody like handing something in public or loading it off a truck. You know, when we've done, you know, for, for the media and, you know, we had the BBC and certain people that came and followed us and that was something that was good for their, for their visuals. But the day-to-day -day activity that's happening is much more discreet. Although I will say that the black market economy that's happening that sprang up uh, after the fall of the Soviet Union in North Korea, it's a very open black market. It's something, it's like, I, we equate it to like the Hunger Games, if you've seen that, where there's a black market, the police know it's a market, it's open, but it has to exist, so it's tolerated. And in terms of the content, we, um, it's been all sorts of different things. You know, we we actually one thing that I love that we did, we've kind of as an organization, Human Rights Foundation has started kind of separating ourselves from the content for a lot of various reasons. Um, a lot of it, you know. We don't really have to worry about licensing issues because I don't think North Korea really worries about that in general. But you know, some of the content that we send in could be, you know, not particularly. We don't own a lot of it. Um, but one thing that we do have that's amazing is Wikipedia created an offline uh, read-only version of the entire Korean language Wikipedia that we can fit on an eight-gig flash drive. So we're like, hi, here is all of human knowledge in one stick. Start reading and just you know. Maybe start with that chapter on North Korea and just see what the rest of the world might be saying. I'm not saying it's the worst place in the world. I'm saying that there is always room for a counter narrative there. But you know, most of what's going in is honestly like K-pop videos, South Korean soap operas. I had a meeting. Actually, was really. I had a meeting with Mark Cherry, the creator of Desperate Housewives, because apparently Desperate Housewives is very popular there, um, and they were waiting for the sixth season. So. Um, so I, I, try, I had to ask him, I was like, so are you cool with me sending a lot of your show into North Korea? It's going to help free a ton of people. He's like, I just don't want to know about it. He's like, please do not put my name in any article that's associated with this. Because I don't, you know, there's a lot of fear of people being targeted if they're associated with this. So um, I, we did a program where we sent thousands of copies of that movie, The Interview, into, uh, into North Korea right after the Sony hack. Sony definitely did not want to be associated with that. And I kept on tweeting at Seth Rogen, like, or, uh, like, and James Franco, I'm like, you guys want to you know, get involved, like, chime in on this? Crickets. Nothing. <laughs> but uh, like I said, it's, it's mostly, we're just trying to reach to pop culture. And I think, honestly, in the Czech Republic, you guys probably have an understanding about the power of the Velvet Revolution and all this stuff about people wanting to have music, outside music and entertainment. And it really is a need. Like I said, these people know the risks they're running, and they're so desperate to connect that they're willing to run the risk. They're willing to go to jail to watch Desperate Housewives. I don't even watch that show, but I'm just saying. <laughs> you there. Hi. Um, with all the hype in South Korea with cryptocurrencies, uh, a awful. tremendous amount of awareness is there. I think the most evolved age I've ever seen. Probably totally. Like 70 to 80 percent general awareness on the streets and ownership of cryptocurrencies. They say there's more crypto users per yeah. capita in South Korea than Absolutely. any country in the world. My question about this is that is there any relationship in that this is about, that has that, is that in Korean culture because of any sort of political motivation? Is there any of that that's being passed from South Korea to North Korea as part of this movement? That's my curiosity. Like an official sense from the, North, from the South Korean government? No, not not official sense on the black market and in the content that's being pushed across by the defectors. Are they are they yet, are they there yet? I will. I mean, well, most of like most of the defectors we're working with are based in South Korea and they're you know in, assimilated into society. Right. But they are. Tr I guess they're, it's more about showing a piece of life, like a genuine piece of life. One thing that, that, they, that some of the, the defectors living in Seoul have done specifically that I thought, thought was fascinating was just take a, like a, a camera with them and just go in their daily life, going to the grocery store, turning on the faucet, driving in the car, going to the parking lot, and just things that would seem kind of banal and basic to us that could really, you know, be eye-opening for people in North Korea have been told, you know, from birth that everyone else is living worse than you. Even if you're starving to death, everyone else is worse off than you. But you're not allowed to verify that. You're not allowed to leave the country or have any other sort of outside media to verify anything that we're saying. But in terms of, like, that what specifically South Korean, like pro-South Korean media they're targeting, I think it's more just about entertainment. You know, South Korean soap operas are addictive and they're really good. But I think it's more about reaching people in a more, in a less direct way. Like if we were sending in propaganda saying like your government is lying to you, that would not be as effective as sending in some really good entertainment that shows people being free and expressing themselves and living a very open life. 
you know? So I think it's more about just showing a, a, a vibrant, beautiful, colorful picture of the world. You know, we did a drive, we did a whole program where we sent in love stories. We did love drives because in North Korean films, there's no, there's nothing that's ever done. There's no kissing, there's no hand holding, there's no romance in North Korean films because there's nothing that's ever supposed to be done above the glorification of the leader. If, uh, if somebody dies in a film, it's done specifically for the, for the country or for the leader. I, I work with a young woman named Yeonbi Park that tells a story um, about her escape. She says when she was 12 years old, she um, saw a pirated copy of Titanic. And uh, she said it took her like a month to watch because the power was very unreliable and she could only watch it in like 15, 20 minute increments. But when she finally got to the end and spoiler alert, um, uh, when she saw that, uh, you know, Leonardo DiCaprio would sacrifice his life for the love of a woman, she said it just blew her mind because she had never seen that in a film. She had never seen, like, why would a man sacrifice for a woman? Oh, that's love. That's what I've been, that's what I know in my heart as a human exists, but that's not, it's never been able to be shown to me clearly. So we said, okay, we're going to send in Romeo and Juliet transfer, uh, translated into Korean and all these beautiful love songs and, you know, all these love stories just to try to, you know, just reach people at the core of their being. And I think when you get down to it, everybody kind of wants the same thing, you know, but it's just a matter of if you, if you force it directly in somebody's face, and they might not be as, as receptive to it as if you present an idea in more of an entertainment sort of context. Did that answer your question at all? I feel like I started... No? <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> yeah, okay. Yes, Mr. Chair. Yes, Mr. Chair. Like, no, but it's okay. <laughs> um, I was just wondering what, uh, like, about the the logistics of, of like distributing it through the black market what type of uh, like is are the numbers increasing the demand and like how do you supply it do you do you just like have an assortment of things based on this curation and then just every month you're bringing them or like you know do you do you check to see uh, whether you need to increase it or or it's not a, too, too well much? honestly we have more flash drives right now than we can actually get into the country, which is not a bad problem to have. You know, it's kind of created this grassroots sort of movement where we have, you know, schools and community groups and stuff that will do like a drive drive for us for like a month and collect 2,000 drives and send it to us. It's great. And there, we can take all sorts of sizes, all sorts of, you know, all sorts of, uh, you know, from you know, 64 gigs to, you know, 256 megabytes. I don't even know if they make that anymore. But, uh, you know, we can always find something to put on there, whether it's books, whether it's outside newspapers or media. But it, it really is, they do, they mass produce it a lot. You know, so we will, they'll decide ahead of time, like, okay, we want to send in this movie or we want to do, you know, 500 Wikipedia. And they'll just kind of create them all at once on these replicators. And then the beauty part about it is inside of North Korea, um, the Notels, um, the, the, the media viewing devices have a USB and a micro SD card uh, port so they can actually start replicating the content inside of that device. So we know that each drive that we're getting in there is not one impression. It could be 25. It could be exponential. It's honestly, what's the, the most frustrating part about this program it's really hard to have analytical data once it's inside North Korea than it is to get it out. And, you know, my partner over in the corner, Austin, he works specifically like on the border with China, and he was able to secure a Notel, an iPad, like a North Korean tablet and phone. We took it to DEF CON to the ha hardware hacking village and like tore it apart and got to like see, you know, the guts of what they had done with these machines to make it like where they couldn't communicate with, with like none of them have Wi-Fi, but they have Bluetooth. But it's, um, you know, it's, it's kind of a lot of, has to be based on a lot of anecdotal evidence, honestly, or anecdotal, you know, stories, because we can't, we don't, we can't really trace where it goes once it's in there. But in terms of the content, it is, like, typically our partners will decide, like, okay, we're doing 500 of this, and then they take it to the border, and they send it in all at once. And then once they have their, they've been working in these distribution networks uh, in North Korea for 10, 15 years. So they are
program, our goal was to uh, increase their, their effectiveness. You know, they were having to buy all of their flash drives at retail cost, you know, 10 or 15 bucks a piece, which really adds up. And honestly, they don't have any support, especially now with the new regime. They don't have any government support. And we were like, look, everybody has a drive laying around. It's not going to cost us anything. If we send it to you, then you cut out all of the cost of your hardware, and then we can make the cost within the black market significantly lower. And uh, that way, anybody that wants to get it doesn't have to say, like, well, am I going to eat today or am I going to see the new Avengers movie? You could do both. <laughs> you, I'll get to and, you, uh, sir. Last, last question. He's had his hand up for a while. Here, feel bad. Okay. okay. Just a short. It's a great project. We're dealing with people who are not used to dealing with information in specific ways. Is that also addressed in, in, in your project? Uh, well, like uh, turning people into information literate people? Or? That is, honestly, that is kind of why we had to start small. You know, we've had a lot of people come up to us like, oh, we should create mesh networks. We should, we need to have different ways to encrypt this. But that is the, the big question is like, how do you protect? How do you start to get newer and more advanced technology to a culture where, especially not, especially outside of the capital, you know, most people don't even have access to a computer, you know, so then even the, to talk about the concept of the internet is, is a little, is a couple of steps away, right? So I think it's, it's starting incrementally, you know, and what we want is just to have a population that has an awareness of what's happening in the outside world. So if regime change happens, if there's something that goes on, at least the population is not worried about, you know, everyone coming to kill them. Because it's kind of like there's always an invisible enemy in North Korea. You know, there's always somebody that, that's coming to get you. And the state is what's protecting you. And if you don't ever have any sort of context about what's actually to, to refute that, then obviously that's what you're going to believe. That's what you're told from, from, from the beginning. But it is, that is honestly... Kind of a kind of a roadblock, you know. We we work, and I think the next step would be getting more hardware for a broader conversation about the convergence of technology and human rights, and how we can empower people within this community to connect. Yes, I'm open to ideas on that. Yeah. Okay. So one more last question. Thank you for that, okay. because that is really is a, an issue. Uh, first of all, thank you. I believe you are doing a great job doing that. It's awesome. Those people got the message, saw the films, and decided they want that Western kind of life. They decided to change everything, like the woman on video saying, I wish some, someday I want to have something like that. But can they? Do I someone to help them to realize the dream to make it true? or where themselves, themselves alone with no help? That is, you know, that's, that's a really good question. And it, obviously, everybody in the country can't defect. You know, that would that'd be the goal. You, under, you see that there's a world outside of there, and you want to go there, you know? And then, but what if you don't have the means? And, you know, I know a lot of people that have tried to escape, and China now has a policy, it has for a while, had a policy of repatriation. So if they catch you in the country, they send you back to North Korea where you are tortured and you're in prison for trying to escape. And the South Korean embassy in China is not allowed to accept or meet with North Korean refugees. Um, this program, I think, is geared more towards, towards people that want to stay in North Korea, that say, you know, this is my home and I want to change it from the inside out. We don't want to inspire people to leave. We want to inspire people to know that their home can be better that they, with the knowledge they have, and, what, what, and, it's, and it's tough because, you know, like I said, there is, the, what, there is you know, some sort of risk involved in actually accessing this, this information. But what I like is that because it's a little bit of a secret, when people watch them, I have a video uh, somewhere else I can show you, when people watch these films together, you know, in secret, they share a secret. You know, and they maybe share it with somebody else, and then they all are in the story. And when people start talking, it's, it's what this guy doesn't want. He doesn't want people to know. He doesn't want them to share. But what really this is focused on is inspiring people to change their world, to know, to have the knowledge to, to change it from the inside out. We can't, we can't expect everyone to escape. Granted, all of our information and pretty much all of our data is based on the stories of the defectors that we work with. 
So, you know, they all found out the knowledge and wanted to leave. But at this point, it's more about their, and even their work is all about focusing back inward and taking the knowledge that they've gained in the outside world and they've gained through media and exposure to try to empower their family and friends and everyone that's back in North Korea to stand up for their rights. Because we all have the same rights, regardless of who the leader is. All right. Thank you guys.